Gentlemen, welcome to the third and last day of ApacheCon 2013. Uh, just before we get started, one quick announcement. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation realizes that sometimes there is a need to print things, boarding passes, particularly if you're shipping anything home, labels and so on. So thanks to the ASF and Stephen Hathaway, there is a printer at the ASF stand if you need to do any printing please feel free uh, to go in and use that. It's, it's there for us all to use. So, without further ado, um, here's Skip Newbury of the Technology Association of Oregon. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> so you're definitely not here to hear me talk, uh, so I'll keep this brief. I, I have the, the job of introducing Luke Kinese, the founder and CEO of Puppet Labs. And uh, what's interesting about Luke, and there's a little bit of reporting about this out on the web, but you know, he grew up in, in Tennessee uh, on a hippie commune, about 1,600 people, and um, you know, that was how he spent his formative years. And between then and now, of course, uh, a lot has happened. Um, found his way to Oregon, uh, was a graduate of Reed College, and afterwards ended up working as a, a system administrator. Saw a lot that he wanted to change and uh, kind of took it upon himself to develop what became <coughs> Puppet. And uh, the rest is history. He now runs a company that was recently recognized as one of the top 25 uh, enterprise startups to bet your career on. Uh, they're growing exponentially. And um, that's just one of the many awards that they've received recently. So without further ado, I want to uh, uh, cede the floor here to Luke Kinese of Puppet Labs. Luke, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Skip. So, um, I'm going to talk about community today, um, but before that, I want to point out that um, nearly everything in this talk, uh, I, I don't mean to say that this is all right, I don't mean to say that you should believe everything I say. Um, before I started the Puppet community, I had some open source experience, but I wouldn't say that I had a lot, and I certainly had no experience in a leadership position. Um, I'd worked in, I, I'd been involved in a lot more bad examples, um, you know, a lot more horrible warning type situations than I had good examples. And most of what we've done in our community has been through trial and error. There are a lot of, a lot of right ways to do things. Of course, there are far more wrong ways to do things. Um, and in general, there are plenty of things we still do wrong. Um, and what I try to ask of everybody, whether it's people in my company, people in my community, or you know, people in my personal life, is uh, to follow Hanlon's razor, which is never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by incompetence. Um, and I like, like to think of that as, I'd rather you think that I was stupid than evil. Um, and one of the things that I think has helped our community is I'm always willing to admit that I'm wrong. So um, I'm not up here to say that this is all the right answer. It's just this is one thing that's worked for me. So I really wanted to call this talk Building Communities, um, because that's the natural way of, of talking about it. But the truth is it's not really about building, it's about growing. Um, it's not like you can go down to the store, you know, you, if you want to build a house, you can buy all the materials you need to do that, you can just do it yourself. You don't have to ask the permission of the house or the land or the wood. The wood's not going to fight back at you generally. Um, this is a lot more like, you, you, ha you can lay all the groundwork, but just because you build it doesn't mean that everybody's going to show up. You have to work very hard to uh, kind of kind of grow the thing from the bottom up. You can't just force it into place. Um, and I think one of the reasons people were interested in me talking was that uh, because this is a, uh, you know, I'm running a company and a, and a project at the same time and it's fantastically difficult to, a lot of companies kind of think you can force a, the creation of a community um, and that's especially where things start to go wrong if you're in a company and you try to kind of force it to happen. So I wanted to give a little bit of history about Puppet so you have an idea of what kinds of communities I'm talking about, what size of communities, um, and you know, what we did in ours. Uh, and then I want to talk through some examples and some, some things we learned in the course of doing this. So I started the project in 2005. Um, and when I started it, I didn't even create a user list because it was going to be, it was another 10 months before, we, before I would have recommended that anybody use the project. So I said, well, start with the dev list. I was the only user on that list, of course. Um, and I went and built some of the infrastructure, like an IRC channel, but there was no one there. Um, one of the things that's a little bit, a uh, little bit different about Puppet, it's not exactly unique, but it's not that common, is when I started the project, I started a company and the software at the same time. Um, this isn't a thing that I did as a hobby for three or four years, realized it could be an interesting company, 
um, and then you know, decided to start commercializing it. From the very first day that I started the product, the project, I wanted to build a software company that allowed me to make, that, in which I could make enough money to afford to pay developers to work on the software. And that was always the way I thought about it. We have very big problems in the operation space. Um, I didn't think I could solve them all by myself. I know, strange. Um, and so my goal was to find a way to make enough money to pay a bunch of software developers. But one of the, one of the reasons that I did that is I had been in other software communities where the, the, the criteria for whether the software was good or not didn't really relate to whether the users liked it or whether it worked to solve the problems. Um, and so what I wanted was a very clean and simple way of saying, how can I tell if my users like my software? And turns out there's a globally agreed upon metric for determining how much someone likes something, and it's they're willing to exchange money for it. So I thought this was a pretty good test. So if I can build a, a piece of software, and I love it, and everyone I know loves it, but no one's willing to pay anything for anything around it, it's probably not very good software. Um, so this decision, both the decision to start the company and the fact that I was open about this, this is a slide that I've been showing, you know, some form of this slide um, for years. I think this was my lunch in Heathrow on the way back from India in 2006, and the reason I took the picture is with, I was in an airport. Do you see how dangerous they are in England? That's metal silverware. I could have taken over the whole place. It's crazy. Um, so that whole starting a company at the same time changed a lot about how we built the community. So four years later, um, we had seen 50,000% growth in our user community. Um, and at the time, there weren't a lot of, when I started Puppet, there were not a lot of um, system administrators, so I probably should have said this. So Puppet is a tool for sysadmins. You probably all know that. You're using it. It's running on your laptops, things like that, right? Um, so it's a tool for sysadmins to make their stupid computers do what they want. Um, so all the people that we're talking about, they're pretty much all sysadmins. Um, when I started Puppet, there were very few sysadmin communities out there. Um, sysadmins, they're surly, um, you know, they're kind of like developers, but with less social skills. Um, I know it is possible, I, trust me. Um, and so we were trying to build, at, at the, at the t about this time, this is one of the largest sysadmin communities. It's not the largest by any stretch, right? But go find the top five, um, you know, IRC channels that have sysadmins in them, and actually there's only three at that time. You know, it's one of those things, like there just aren't a lot of them out there. So I was really kind of starting from scratch in a lot of ways. Um, we had, by this time we'd gotten to three employees, and we had one event. Um, it was about 80 people in San Francisco. Uh, this was also the year that we took venture capital. Um, and it was the year before this that I gave birth, my wife gave birth to twins, um, which was a little momentous too, but um, didn't affect the growth of the community that much. So four years after that, um, we're now 10 times that growth. I know the growth has dropped dramatically from 50,000% in four years to only 10x. Uh, so we've got more than 5,000 people on our user list. Um, and, and if you go through all of our different community properties, you know, our, our, our questions site and our forge, you know, you, you know, it could be, it's certainly above 10,000 total. Um, large dev list, uh, a very large IRC channel. And what, what really surprises me is not just the numbers of people in our community, but that they're really, uh, it's a really functional community, too. There's a lot of people actually getting real work done and still operating successfully in it. Um, just in the last year, we've, uh, we've now, and then and I wrote this on Sunday, the number is uh, above 900 Forge modules. We've, we've more than tripled in the last year the, the number of um, pre-built solutions people have published on that. Um, last year, we had 17, I think, or 16 events around the world, including uh, PuppetConf in San Francisco. Um, which we're going to have again in August this year. Last year was about 850 people. This year we're hoping for about 1,600. We're now about to about 120 employees. And as of a few months ago, for the very first time, we have a, um, a community manager, somebody who's actually dedicated to trying to make sure that um, the mistakes we've made here, we, we don't repeat again. Um, so how did we go about uh, encouraging building this kind of uh, community, growing this kind of community? Um, and especially one of the things that I think we've done relatively well in the public community is make pretty major changes without having major outcry. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that uh, is really hard to do in communities because the, the thing that allows a community to exist is a sense of identity. And when you go in and change anything that people associate with their identity, they start to get slightly upset. Um, so I think that's one of the, the, the very difficult things in to do in community. One of the first reactions I hear from almost anybody, especially anybody in a company, when they're going to build a community is, how do I make sure I can control, you know, that, that people don't to, to do too much of something? How do I make sure people don't ask too many questions or aren't too rude or things like that? And I always tell people that 
your biggest problem, you know, empty lists don't need moderation. Your biggest problem is not how do I control all of the traffic on my website? How do I control all of the community, right? Your biggest problem is, seriously, there's no one there. You know, the vast majority of communities, the vast majority of companies, the vast majority of software projects don't have users, users don't have customers, don't, you know, your, your biggest problem is just getting to the point where you're lucky enough to have a community management problem. Getting to the point where you're lucky enough to have, you know, the need to do things like moderation, to, to enforce, you know, community guidelines or things like that. Um, and so a lot of people's natural first reactions are cover the when traffic's too large, um, and I just think that's uh, the wrong way to look, about, look at it. It's like if you're building a website, and you know, it takes you three months to build the site, and seven months to build the scalable back end, and you get to the end, you're, you know, you're 10 months into the project, you have zero users, and you, know, you could have launched that site seven months earlier. You didn't need the back end until you actually had any users. Um, so beyond that focus on worrying more about getting people into the community than I was about what they were doing there, um, my, my core tactic in building my community was to answer every single question. And I really do mean that. Um, from the time that I started in 2005, well, again, there was no one there at the time. There weren't any questions at the time. But by around 2006, there were a lot of people showing up, asking a lot of questions. Um, and I, my goal was to essentially be present enough, to be active enough, that even though I might be the only other person in the room, or I may be the only other person on the list, I wanted to feel like a crowded room. Um, and I was very, very responsive, very active, and you know, you just kind of, you got to hustle all day. Um, and, but one of the most important things about that is you even have to answer, even when you don't know. Um, in the early days of a community, there are a lot of problems, there are a lot of things you don't know. Somebody shows up and says, hey, how do I solve this problem? You kind of go, I, I don't know. Um, you need to be comfortable saying that. Uh, the only thing you have in the early days of a community is, is a small amount of credibility. You, you haven't done anything, you haven't, you know, you, you don't have the, the proof but what you can do is, is build trust with your community. Um, and if you start telling people things that aren't true, if you start telling people, oh yeah, you can definitely do that, or yes, it'll scale, or yes, it's definitely secure, or you know, all these things that you hope are true, that you think are true, because you know, you're smart and attractive and things like that, but that doesn't mean that the product will work for what your customers, what your users are trying to do with it. Um, so in those early days, truth is more important than anything at all. Um, and so my goal was to answer everything and engage with people on whether this would work, whether it's a good idea, whether you should try that. And in many cases, I would say, this isn't a good idea. I don't think you should try that. I think if you try it, it'll fail. And in some of those cases, people would go, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. Screw you. And you know, bad things would happen or great things would happen. Who knew? And in a lot of cases, what would happen is people would go, OK, thanks. And they leave. They come back in a year later, check the project out again, see if it worked for them that time. But in the meantime, they would go tell all their friends, you know, hey, you should check this thing out. Maybe it'll be more appropriate for you than it was for me. I had a lot of people that I've talked to over the years who said, you know, I heard about it. It didn't work for me. It wasn't a good idea. I didn't actually have any computers, you know, whatever the answer was. Um, but I told my friends about it, and they love it. Um, so it, it really, there is a lot of value in just making sure you're truthful about the, the situation. Um, one of the things is, relatively quickly you have to learn, even though you, you want to make sure that every question is answered, you don't always want to answer them all right away. You have to give room for somebody else to show up and be right. Um, this is something that as I became, as I went from being a project lead to being a CEO, um, you have the same thing. You have to learn how to let other people answer. You have to learn how to let other people take the floor and really gain expertise, and in a lot of cases, be wrong. You have to learn how to let somebody else on the list show up answer a question and be incorrect. And what you don't want to do is, five seconds after that happens, send an email to the list pointing out how wrong that person is and then correcting him or her in front of the entire community. That's not the right way to do it. Um, just like when I'm in a meeting and somebody makes a mistake, I don't stand up and go, that's wrong, here's the right answer. Um, so you have to work with the community to help them grow to become the people who are going to answer your questions and build things for you. Um, you have to give others time to help. Um, so this transparency, this, this willingness to admit that everything's not perfect, that there are mistakes, that there are problems, that your project won't work for every single use case, um, it can be hard. And the truth is that if your project worked for every use case, you probably wouldn't be building it, right? What's the whole point in starting a project is that, that there's some new special thing that makes you different, that makes you special. That's why you built the thing in the first place. So acting like that new special purpose thing should also work for everything else, it doesn't make much sense, but people's goal, you know, people are, are really hesitant to say, yep, it won't work for that. Um, and this is especially hard because you kind of have two states in most projects. One, in the early days, your project sucks, right? 
You just started it, doesn't have any users, there's nobody actually using it in production anywhere, it's got lots of bugs, it's unstable, it doesn't probably work on the platform you care about, it's got all these problems. Um, and if it's a mature, well, now it's really slow, you can't get, you, you can't things, you can't get things to move very quickly, um, and you know, there are all these other kind of what feel like political issues. Um, and so what you have to do is flip that around and say, well, there are things that are great about each of those stages, right? If you're in an early stage project, you can move very, very quickly. You can be extremely responsive. And if you're in a late stage project, you're integrated with everything, you run on everything, you're extremely stable, you're very secure, you've got a lot of users or a lot of people who are trained in the project. So you really need to have to, ha have to look at what are the great aspects of the stage that you're at and focus on that and focus on getting value from that in your community and not, not be uncomfortable about admitting what's not what's not great. Um, I talked earlier about some of the major transitions we've gone through at, in the Puppet community um, and how transparency is, is a big enabler for what's allowed us to get through those things. Um, so when we go to, to do a big thing, we try to be very clear about everything, not just what we're doing, but really the why. I, I feel like, um, and th there are a lot of great talks on this. I think uh, Daniel Pink has a great TED talk on this. Um, on You have to really be able to talk about the whys and not just the hows and the whats. Um, so when you talk about what you're gonna do, you know, hey, here's this transition we need to make in the community, here's this thing we need to do that's a really big shift, you have to be able to talk about why that's an important shift. And sometimes the why is for you and sometimes the why is for them, but you need to be able to go all the way through that. Um, and one of the keys, again, everyone in my community knew I was trying to make money. They all knew I had a company. They all knew that a lot of, and so when I talked about what I was doing, when I talked about why this made sense for us, why this made sense for them. I could say, you know, this is, this is the right trade-off for my organization, this is the right trade-off for you, um, and that meant that almost no one was cynical, right? No one looked at me and said, I think he's doing that to make money, because I would go, well, yeah. Um, so it really helped. And, you know, for what, it's, for what it's worth, I run the same kind of full transparency in my own organization. Everybody in my company knows how much money is in our bank account every week. Um, so this kind of transparency is, it's difficult for many people, it's especially difficult for companies. Um, if you've got a, a, you know, a financial organization, that, a for-profit company that's trying to build a, co a community, um, they're often doing it somewhat cynically. And um, to become authentic, they have to kind of be willing to tell the truth, be willing to be transparent about what's actually happening. Um, this is especially true if they aren't the founding developers of the project, that they're joining the community. Um, being willing to say, this is why we're here. This is what we get out of this relationship. We know you're not doing this for altruistic reasons. You're a for-profit company. You're literally forbidden by the structures of your company to do things for altruistic reasons. Um, so companies have to work extra hard to demonstrate that authenticity, to demonstrate that they're being transparent. Um, it's very strange. So I, uh, so I mentioned earlier I have 120 employees in my company. It's, there's probably more people than that in this room right now, but um, in my company I have a rule that when you're in a meeting, um, you don't get to use your laptop. And I, will, uh, I have a rule that every time somebody in the meeting is looking at an electronic device, they're the first person to get a question asked to them. So I'm not used to this, uh, all these people with their laptops. Anyway, um, so companies are naturally secretive. Their, their natural reaction is to um, not tell, is to tell the least amount possible to everybody, um, and you just kind of have to suck it up. This is open source. You gotta be a lot more open about everything. But transparency isn't quite the same thing as openness. Openness is telling everybody everything, and transparency is being, being willing to say, here, you know, being open about everything you can, and then being transparent about what you can't be open about. You know, there are a lot of questions. I, I still do a lot of talks um, at Puppet Comps, and I uh, do a Q&A at almost every one of them. Um, I've got one in uh, London, then Amsterdam coming up. Um, and I'll answer almost any question, but you know, there are some questions you'll ask me, like, you know, whatever, the, what the stock allocations of the company are, and I'm gonna go, eh, can't tell you that, right? So it's not about dodging, it's, it's, it's not like you have to answer everything, but you do need to be uh, transparent about what you can't be open about. Um, this can end up being pretty awesome, though. There are a lot of cases where this, this process of being willing to admit where things don't work has worked out really well. There was this period of time where one of our core community members was in Australia, um, Australia is, I have no idea why, is chock full of great sysadmins. Um, and while I was sleeping, he would file tickets and feature requests and uh, things like that. And when he was sleeping, I would go fix them all or add those features. And it was this kind of um, uh, TikTok kind of relationship that wouldn't have worked if I was trying to be, um, you know, trying to act like we were more awesome than we were. Um, I think almost every community has this rule, be nice. Uh, not very many communities succeed at being nice. Um, a lot of cases, people are, 
people are comfortable with certain kinds of rudeness. People are comfortable with technical rudeness. Well, it's okay if I'm mean to that person. They're wrong. Um, I actually don't know how we succeeded at this. I, I can't point to a technique or a practice that, that we had that resulted in um, people generally actually being polite and nice to each other and primarily focused on getting the work done rather than you know, scoring points. Um, one of the things that I am both most surprised by and most, ex most impressed by is almost the complete lack of religion in our community. And again, these are sysadmins. They're, they're religious about almost everything, and almost everything they're religious about does not matter at all. Like most things that people are you know, religious about in technical communities. That's why it's religion, right? You're like, you've gone beyond the rational excuses for why you like this technology for the other, versus the other one, and you're, you're into just like raw emotion at that point. Um, so we really have uh, a lot of people who are, you know, again, focused on the problems and how to solve them and not focused on you know, scoring points, who's right. You know, I, 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 I came to this conclusion in 1999, and I'm not going to change my mind now. We don't get a lot of that. Um, for my purposes, and, and frankly, if, you're, if your goal is growth, this is the, almost the only thing you can't afford to get wrong. Um, that's, that's not really true, but if your goal is growth, you have to have a community that embraces newbies. And this is one of the things I think a lot of communities really struggle with. Because the goal is, on the one hand, to build credibility in the community, to become, to become kind of one of the inside circle, to become, to get a lot of experience, to get a, to get kind of build your name in the community. And in that case, when you want to hold those people who participate so much, you want to hold them up on a pedestal, it's hard at the same time to say, people who show up and don't know anything about the project should be treated really well also. But in our world, we worked very hard to make sure that when you show up and you ask what seemed like a stupid question, we still treat you with respect every time. We never wanted somebody to show up and feel like, they shouldn't ask a question, or they shouldn't be confused, or they should be more educated than they were. We wanted a very newbie-friendly community, and you know, that's, that's really worked out very well for us. Our entire community has grown by word of mouth. Again, we, we had 17 events last year. We're going to have, um, I said 30 this year. The truth is I don't know what the total number is. We're going to have about 15 just this quarter. Um, obviously, all of us can do that math. That should be something like 60 events. I don't know if it's going to actually turn out to be that number, but it's going to be a big number. 30 to 50% of the attendees of those events are brand new to Puppet, and they showed up because a friend of theirs or someone they know says, hey, you should go check out this Puppet thing. So they show up completely ignorant. You know, in many cases, they know roughly what Puppet is for. Oh, it's in the systems world, and it's spelled P-U-P-P-E-T. Um, that's about it, right? So we have to be very comfortable with people showing up completely ignorant. Um, and we've done this, we don't have you know, much in the way of, we, we have essentially no advertising. We've done a little bit periodically, but not much. Um, it's all about online engagement and then lots of hustling on the ground. Um, a lot of time that I've spent in the last eight years has been at conferences like this, walking the floor. Um, and when I go to conferences, you know, in my opinion, Expo's the, the like, presentation center, and any of you who are running the funding for this conference, you can close your ears. Um, they're kind of useless for community, in the, especially in the early days. Um, you know, and even when you're really big, you know, we're at this point where we're, we're pretty big. The, the, Show floors are useful as a meeting place, but like we don't sell things very much there. It's a lot more like uh, a conversation and some storytelling. The people who we meet at those, those expo floors are generally not going to turn into customers very quickly. Um, I'm going a bit more slowly than I expected here. Um, so when I go to conferences, I give talks like this one. I run boffs. I do everything I can to get in front of as many people as possible. And this is kind of controversial. I don't ever go to talks. I just spend all day on the floor hustling. That's all I did in, the, in that process. And it wasn't about selling. I hustled, I, I, I practiced, I pitched the story. When you go to 100 people that you don't know, and you as a geek find the gumption to tell 100 people you've never met who are probably as surly as you are, hey, here's this new project that I'm trying, and you should try it out. And is there something I can help you with? And oh, you hate it. And wow, that was really painful. Um, do that a bunch. You'll get good at some point. You, know, you just got to keep trying. Um, and, and when it comes to working on the ground, it is really used to, useful to visit people. And that's true whether you're talking in the online community sense. Go find out the communities that you're somewhat like, that have people that you would like to join your community. Go find them, work with them, talk to them, meet them, convince them that you have credibility and that the stuff you're doing is awesome. Go attend their conferences, submit talks that should not go. I gave a talk on what amounted to application of theoretical math to development at a Ruby conference um, because I was just, I was just throwing everything I could out to get, to get the ability to go you know, join these communities. Um, and when you're out at a conference, 
you know, you got to work the whole day. It's, it's, it's two eight-hour days. You got eight hours at the conference and then eight hours of after-conference events. You can sleep when you're home. Um, I gave talks in five countries in six months. Like I said, that, that picture earlier was from a, uh, on the way back from India, where I'd given three talks in three countries or something like that in the space of 11 days. Um, my practice, my whole, this whole time has been to be extremely available. Um, I have a default accept on almost everything. It's only recently that if random phone numbers start, if I get a random call, I don't answer it. Um, for the longest time it was, you know, you could be a community member calling from Italy or you could be somebody who wants to pay me. You know, for a long time, the only way to get me to, the only way to buy anything from me was to literally call me and say, where do I send the money? Um, because I was, I was that busy and so that was my sales model is I will, I will wait until somebody asks me where to send the check. Um, so in that case, you always want to answer. Um, every email I've sent for the last eight years has got my, my mobile phone number in it. Um, it's, I'm very easy to find. Uh, I'm still kind of haunted by the sound that the uh, Colloquy IRC application makes when somebody mentions my name in IRC because it would you know, wake me up from sleep, it would pull me away from dinner. Um, you know, if you asked any question anywhere, if you mentioned my name on the internet, I was there to answer your question pretty darn quickly. So there are a number of things that we've learned in the course of doing this that um, you know, we didn't get right the first time, um, especially as a company. One is, it is, it is just difficult to manage your, your organizational, your company priorities, and the community priorities. Um, and it's pretty easy to, to kind of look up in six months and realize that you've been really focused on your internal priorities, and the community's been outside kind of, you know, banging on the windows and yelling at you, and, and you haven't noticed because you're too busy trying to make, it, make enough money to feed yourself. Um, it's very difficult to get this right, and the only way we ever got this right in the end was to have people who were focused on making sure the community were getting the support that they needed. And this isn't about mollifying, right? It's not about going to the community and saying, you're special, you're attractive, we like you. It's about really addressing their needs. It's about making sure the bugs they care most deeply about are being fixed in the next release. It's about making sure that the things that are making it difficult for them to convince their bosses to use the project are really being worked on. It's about making sure that the platform they care about, the new release of that platform, and that your product is ready for that new release when it comes out, so that when they deploy it into production on 10,000 nodes, you know, they're not gonna have problems. Um, when you bring employees into your company, they often don't get community. They don't know why it matters. They don't care about it. Um, you have to find a way to convince them, to teach them about community, or you have to get them away from your community. There are, in, especially in companies, there are places, there are employees who don't need to care about community. They don't need to be great at it. And if you have a, but if you have an employee who's supposed to care about community, they better be good at it. You have to actually, you know, one of our onboarding process, part of our onboarding process is um, helping our employees understand the value and uh, work done in the community. Um, it's very tempting uh, and, and we've done this, you know, a, a lot of open source communities do this differently, but we work hard not to announce things to our community. Um, we've made this mistake periodically, and it's really important to say, you know, here's this thing that we're thinking about doing. Here's this thing that we expect to do in a month, or, you know, if it's a small thing in a week or tomorrow, um, and give a chance to say, for the community to say, we think this is a horrible idea, or, hey, is there some way I can help, or, hey, you've missed this edge case that's actually pretty important, what do you want to do about that? Um, Big changes need lots of warning. Uh, when we changed the license of Puppet, I had been talking about it publicly at events and on the lists and in tickets for literally more than a year. And it took us six months of, of a lot of other things to, to make that happen. So you need a lot of notice and you need to listen. It's not enough to say, by the way, next week we're going to do this. And then you, know, you go on vacation for a week, you come back next week and then you do that. You have to engage, right? You have to put it out there, have a conversation about it. And, and if you don't get any responses, if you post this thing and nobody says anything, you probably did something wrong. You have to get somebody to say, I heard you, and I think this is a decent idea, or at least I'm not gonna come and throw a Molotov cocktail through your window, hypothetically speaking. Um, so I wanted to talk through some of the large changes that we made in our community um, that it, I think were pretty successful, and that there were times where it was tempting to get it wrong. There were times where I said, you know what? I wanna do this, and then I went, that's probably stupid. So. One day, this guy, this Australian, again, I mentioned Australia is full of good sysadmins. I have no idea why. This guy, James Turnbull, shows up and he goes, hey, I'm going to write a puppet book. And I was like, uh-uh, you don't know anything about puppet. Plus, I'm going to write the puppet book. And, uh, and then I went, wait, I work like 80 hours a week. I'm never going to write a puppet book. Also, our docs kind of suck. So I went to him and I said, oh, how about this? I'll answer any question you ask if, in exchange, 
you always update the docs. And if you use all that in a book too, that's fine. I don't care if you profit on it, because everyone knows that people write technical books for profit, right? Everyone knows that? <laughs> exactly. Um, I'll help you with your book, but in exchange, you have to do something for our community. You have to update all those docs. So by the time he'd written that book, he'd also completely rewritten our docs. Um, and he'd gotten so engaged in the community. And he was one of those people who, before too long, you know, anybody, any question answered on the, on the, the channel or on the list, he could answer as, as well and as quickly as I could. Um, so this is one of those transitions where at first I had this desire to say, no, this is a thing that I'm going to own. I'm going to be the author of the puppet book because I want that. And then I went, that's never going to happen. Um, and it actually worked out really, really well for us. Um, like I mentioned earlier, in 2009, my company took venture capital. Um, and you know, I'm sure many of you have been in open source communities where this happens. There are a lot of ways for this to go wrong. Um, one of the ways in which it went right, one of the reasons it worked out well for us, I think there are two major reasons. One is, um, again, my company, my, my, my community knew what I was doing. They knew why I was doing it. And so no one was surprised that I was trying to grow the company. And two is everyone had seen me hustling for four years, right? They'd seen me out trying to do this, and they'd seen, frankly, that I was, I was really struggling. I, you know, I, I meet, there's a company here in town, JAMA Software, and the founders been able to grow it to 70 people without taking any venture capital. And I just feel like that's so impressive because I tried that for four years and I did not succeed. Um, by the end of four years, I was three people. I needed the help. I needed the investment to be able to grow the way that we've been able to grow since then. Um, and so they knew I wasn't selling out. They knew I was doing this to hire more programmers. And that's what I began doing right away. Um, I think the biggest change we made was in 2011, we switched from the GPL to the Apache license. Um, and out of the you know, 3,000 or so people in our community at this time, we had two people complain. And you know, to give you a sense of, of what that looks like, one of those people's nickname on IRC is Windows Refund. So you could tell he was going to be, you know, he, was, he already had a position uh, in terms of what the li right license was and, and how, to, how to do this. Um, and the reason why this worked so well is we were, ex again, I began really, really early. I spent more than a year working with the community, not even announcing it, just saying, hey, here's the thing we think we're going to do. And then we spent six months directly engaging, getting all the CLAs signed, getting to the point where we could make this license change. Um, and we were very clear about why. Some of it was, you know, yes, we want to grow our company. We think the right way to grow our company is to have more of a focus on integrations. We think, you know, with a GPL, you have a little bit more likelihood of license revenue, but fewer people are going to integrate with your software. With the Apache license, you're more likely to have product integrations, but you're not really going to be able to make the same kind of, you can't relicense your product for revenue, um, at least not as easily. And we went to our community and said, hey, we think, this is why we think this change makes sense. And it, you know, in either case, you could say, this is going to grow my company in a certain way. That's going to grow my company in a certain way. Um, at the time, we felt like the MySQL to Sun to Oracle transition had kind of poisoned the well for GPL as a route to license revenue. Um, and that's certainly what we had found in trying to work with partners. We'd go talk to partners, and they would say, I'm sorry, I can't integrate with your software. It's GPL. Or you know, not can't, but you know, my lawyers, when I call them, they froth at the mouth and they yell at me. And so I'm not going to do this. Um, it was absolutely not a religious conversation for us. And that meant that when we talked to our community, we were able to make that conversation entirely non-religious. Again, except for two people. I had one. The, the other person in my community member, when I changed the license, uh, emailed me and said, why are you forking the puppet project? And I said, I think technically you've got that all wrong. Um, so it, it, was, it was a great transition. And this is, you know, to me, I, I look at this and say, the fact that we navigated this and not, not only still have a great community, but have seen continued very strong growth since then, I feel like is a great testament to the strength of the community, even though it's a vendor-driven community, even though, you know, yeah, all those things. So uh, I've left, I think, about seven minutes for questions. Um, I told you I have twins. This is uh, how they get to school periodically. Um, so any questions? Oh, good. I hate standing here awkwardly for seven minutes when nobody asks me anything. Yes, thanks. Uh, Luke, I wondered, one of the differences perhaps between the puppet community and the Apache community is that the Apache community is actually a federation of, of different projects. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for having the projects help work together on community development? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I think when, when, uh, when I was approached about giving a talk about community at the Apache project, I was like, uh, really? I don't think I have anything to teach those people about community. I think it's the other way around. Um, 
So in a lot of ways, I, I, I think the Apache community is a great example of, of how to do community. And so um, there aren't a lot of things that I can say, you know, hey, you should do this differently or, or something like that. Um, to me, community is about identity. And so the, the big question becomes, what is, what is the shared identity across these projects? What is it about the Apache community that provides an identity for the people who are members of that community? Um, there's a reason why there's, there's not really a Windows community. There's a reason why there's not, you know, there's a lot of things that, that kind of everyone has that, right? Um, and at this point, enough people are using Macs now that there's not really a Mac community as much, right? You have to find a small enough group of people that they have some sense of identity away from the, the, the mass groups around them. So, you know, the, the big thing that I would be looking at is, if it's not the piece of software you're using, what is the shared sense of identity that people who are members of the Apache community have? Okay, thanks, yeah, great talk. Uh, I have a quick question. So, you, you talk about this, the change of the licensing from GPL to Apache. My understanding is, in, in most of the aspects, Apache license is actually more lenient compared with GPL. It gives you more freedom. So I'm just curious what are the concerns those people have when you made this transition? Yeah, so um, absolutely, the Apache license is more lenient. And the, the big concerns, and, it, and one of the things that I found most frustrating about this um, is there are a lot of lawyers who will happily give you advice that is completely useless, um, but at least it's, it's, it's expensive. Um, <laughs> and almost everyone I talk to who is a lawyer was essentially like, their basic response was, you should be very afraid. Um, and so when I go talk to a company about, you know, hey, you should build this integration, or you, know, you should even run my software on your, on your hardware, they would go, I don't know. I've talked to my lawyers, and they've said, I should be very afraid. Um, and what the lawyers seem to have learned is that Apache essentially has no, um, it can't force you to do anything else. It gives you rights to use the project, but it doesn't force you as the user or as the developer to do anything else. Um, and the GPL, and then there are a lot of things that, that are frankly unanswered about the GPL in law. There are things that we actually, we literally don't know about what triggers the GPLs. Uh, I don't, uh, there are ways that I'm not supposed to talk about it on stage. Whatever that provision is called that causes you to have to open source your own software, that, that provision getting triggered, literally, the lawyers don't know what triggers it. So if I've got a Perl library and I ship another Perl library, does that, you know, those are things that no one really knows. And so that uncertainty causes a lot of lawyers, especially at big companies, Cisco and VMware are both investors of mine at this point. You know, their lawyers were completely unwilling to, to sanction their people integrating with a GPL project because they, they literally couldn't tell you whether as a result they would have to open source something crazy. And, and Cisco, you know, they made some mistakes on um, some of their GPL software as part of the Linksys project, Linksys uh, routers, and so they got really burned by that in terms of they made this mistake, and, the, and what they learned was the easiest way to solve this is just to not use GPL, is to use Apache, rather than expecting all of their employees to understand the nuance of what they can and can't do. And again, since it'll, some of these things are literally undecided, um, there were questions about what we had to open source that I couldn't find, <laughs> again, the only advice I could find was you should be very afraid. Um, and so rather than having to be afraid all the time, um, which I frankly still do, but not for that reason, um, we just decided to switch licenses. Any other questions? Perhaps the, uh, <clears throat> perhaps the Portland beer is taking its effect. I know a number of people went out and had a good time last night. Yeah, the coveted 9 a.m. talk on the last day of the conference, I think, uh, <laughs> you know. Yes, the only, the only better slot is immediately after one of our rather good lunches when uh, the, blood, the blood, there's a fight between the stomach and the brain for the bloodstream. The coveted lunch spot. <laughs> the graveyard of the speaker's world. <laughs> okay, well, if nobody else has any questions, then I'd just like to say thank you very much. Luke Canise. Thank you.